everybody. Welcome to Digging Deeper Jazz. I'm Jeff Antoniak. Welcome to the video this week. So I want to talk about twoing the five. This is going to apply to all instruments. Even drummers are going to get something out of this because it's going to talk to you about the tension and release you use in your playing. Certainly if you're a comping instrument and a solo instrument, a horn, a piano, a trombone, whatever it is, twoing the five. It's a pretty cool idea. It's going to give us an idea how to extend existing chords that we have, but it's also going to give us a framework to understand those millions of chord changes we're often faced with. So both sides of that coin is going to get uh, a lot of good information today. So before we jump into that, I want to talk about this new year that's ahead of us, 2020. I, we're still in the first week of January. And um, lots of cool, exciting things going on here for Digging Deeper Jazz. Of course, a free video every week, 52 videos coming up this year. But the coolest thing, as I think about what I really want to achieve with you folks, um, it involves getting together something like in person. We need to be able to be communicating with each other. So for that reason, I'm doing uh, Digging Deeper uh, Jazz Wire workshops around the US, Canada, and Europe this year. So if you just go to the events page at Jazzwire, you can find where those are. But the point is for us to get together and do some real work. Jazz is not about this one-way YouTube street of someone lecturing to you. That's not how music works. Music is about getting together with real people and playing together and getting feedback and all that, all that amazing human squishy kind of stuff. That's what we need more of, and that's what I want to provide for you guys. So there's going to be events like that. There's the adult uh, jazz camp that I've been doing for 16 years now, Maryland Summer Jazz, this July, if you want sort of a longer, more intense thing, and jazz wire. Not all of us can travel to Washington, D.C., or not all, all of us can travel to Bavaria for one of the summer workshops or uh, to San Diego or whatever. For those of you, Jazzwire, I built this to create this kind of community and this feel of working together and actually working together. So that is what I'm excited about for 2020 is putting some real teeth to this stuff. I love that thousands of you watch this every day. I love that you're inspired and I hear back from you and all that fantastic stuff. Well, let's, let's really get the ball rolling. I'd love to get you involved with any of that. So drop me a line and let's, uh, let's see what we can do together. Okay, let's get into this twoing the five thing. What the heck does that even mean? Well, we, we see five chords, dominant chords. When I say five chords, I don't mean five different chords. A five chord in traditional classical harmony is a dominant chord. A dominant chord very often has that function of five to one. Now, if I'm losing you already, don't worry. We're going to circle back to this, but this is great stuff for you to know. So the dominant chord, we see dominant chords all the time in jazz. The blues is a great instance. So you can see on this sheet, I wrote out a blues for you. And the top line of the blues is traditional, very straight ahead changes, not very embellished, not really bebopified. Um, the lower line, I've added some chord changes to what's going on. What I did is twoed some of the fives. I'm not sure if that's legitimate English or not, but I put a two chord in front of some of the fives. So that's the idea we're talking about here today. So the first step is you're gonna be looking for songs that have dominant chords. Well, good news, that's 95% of all the songs you're ever gonna see, okay? Maybe a modal song every once in a while is only minor. By the way, next week we're talking about modal songs. Okay, so if you look at this blues tune here, it's a very straight ahead C blues. Now look in the fourth measure on the sheet, and we just see that simple C7 chord. Well, what we can do if we want to expand that harmony, if we want to be able to use some of our 2-5 material, we can say to ourselves, well, that C7, I'm going to call that a 5 chord. If that's 5, what is 2? So we have to do a little logic experiment here. So if C is 5, Maybe we should think of what is one. C is five of, we count backwards, all the way down to we decide that F is one, okay? So we're, we're just, you know, just follow me. We're not in the key of F here, but we're just doing this little thing. C is, if C is a five chord, what is its two chord? So if C is five, F is one, what is its two chord? What is the second chord in F? It's a G minor. So what I did is put a G minor in front of that C7. And so instead of it being like the top stave, that sort of lonely C7, if you look at the bottom stave of the blues, um, in the fourth measure, it's now a 2-5 progression. 
That two five, of course, is going to the one chord in the next measure. So what I've done is taken one chord and put two chords in its place. I've taken a lone dominant chord and put a two five there. Why would I do that? I'm doubling your problems, right? There's two chords where before there only used to be one. Well, for a lot of us, we've got some two five licks, some two five devices. We have some two five uh, melodies in our head. Now, if we don't, this is a fantastic next step for you to be working on. You need to be developing your jazz vocabulary. The adult amateurs I'm talking to, the semi-pros, developing more of that. That's what most of my practice is these days, is learning more sort of great classic melodies, licks, things like that. So what this does is create is takes a chord that used to be just that C7, and maybe you had some information to play on a C7, you had some ideas of what to comp on a C7, what to improvise over a C7. Well, now when you see that G minor C7, that probably opens up some other ideas, some other licks you hadn't thought about. So we can do this almost anywhere you have a dominant chord. So let me do this. I'm gonna play for you uh, just the first four measures the way it is on the top stave with nothing special going on. I'm just gonna treat it like the C chord. Then the second time through, I'm gonna play through and play that two five there. See if you notice that it sounds different, that I played a little bit different. Check it out. So I hope you noticed a little difference between the fourth measure. That's all we're listening for is that fourth measure. When I was treating it as that static C7 chord, I thought about particular things. When I saw that 2-5 the second time, I played more rolling information. I actually put a great lick down on the sheet for you to look at, for you to use. If you don't know it, learn that one. You could put any 2-5 material there. Um, so one of the big things it did is actually changed my phrasing. The first time I improvised for one, improvised for two, improvised for three, and I sort of slowed down in the fourth measure, ended my phrase. That's very typical. Well, the second time through with that two five, I improvised, improvised, improvised. In the fourth measure, I actually amped it up a little bit. So the energy of what I was doing, this is what I was talking about for drummers earlier on. Drummers, when they're sort of aware of what's going on with the harmony, they get a sense of how to manage their drum fills and when they're moving things ahead and when they're just swinging and stuff like that. So this idea, and all it was, was I identified a dominant chord. I could have picked practically any of them. I picked the one in the fourth measure, put its two chord in front of it. So let's look at another place. Let's look at the last measure of the blues. Now, in that last measure of the blues, usually we just have, again, that dominant chord, the G chord. So I'm thinking to myself, what is its two chord? So you could come up with lots of little tricks. That, you know, so you can use the language I'm using, or you could just say, what's a minor chord a fourth below that? That's another way to get the same answer. What's the two chord of G7? The answer is D minor. Okay, what's a fourth below G7 and minor? D minor. So come up with whatever little mental translation you want. So now we have a 2-5 in the last measure where the chords used to just be a 5 chord. Now this comes up in Jazzwire a lot. We've got over 200 people from around the world working together at Jazzwire. And one of the questions today was, hey Jeff, your lead sheet for the song we're working on in the Green community has different chords than the Abersold and different chords again than the iReal Pro app that I'm using, play along tracks. Um, and my answer is they're all, they're sort of pretty much kind of the same, but how would they know, right? They look different. Well, here's an example of the 12th measure, top stave and bottom stave look different. We can see they're similar, but they look really different too. And so here's how this sort of thing happens. Um, for one version of the song, they just have the five chord. For one version of the song, they tood the five. So let me do an example uh, here. So what I'm gonna do is play the last four measures the first time through, I'm gonna do just the five chord. The second time through, I'm gonna play my lick. I'm gonna play, I'm gonna two the five, add a little motion to it. Here we go.
Okay, so there was another uh, example in the 12th measure of taking a five chord. That's what we saw on the top, Dave. And I toed the five. I put another chord in front of it, a chord that's very consonant, that really leads there. If you have questions about this, this is going to be game-changing, life-changing, jazz-changing for you. This is the kind of stuff I want to work with you on. It's a big deal. And um, so there's two examples. We, we looked at the fourth measure. We looked at the twelfth measure. Now you'll notice that the last line of the tune, I changed the chord changes. I put in a D minor G7. I two to five there. In the eighth measure, you'll notice I changed. So that's, I got even a little bit deeper. So that's, that's something we can look at together next time too. We don't have to get into that one right now, but I put some good examples for you of how we can take a simple set of jazz changes, not even jazz changes, blues changes, simple, simple changes, and make them a little bit more intricate. This is what the bebop guys were doing. Charlie Parker and the post-bop guys too, Benny Golson and folks like that, were adding a lot of these great chord changes to what was going on. So again, that's something you can do when you look at a Charlie Parker blues like Blues for Alice. Now you can make sense of why so dang many chords and you can see how they relate to each other. Or when you're faced with a very basic set of blues chord changes and you want to spice it up, you're a more intermediate, advanced, semi-pro player, this is how you can do it. You start adding two five progressions that aren't written in there. You start twoing the five. All right, fantastic. So I hope that gives you a really good head start on this, sort of opens your mind to some of these possibilities. Now, uh, next week, I'm heading to the Gen Conference, Jazz Educators Conference, going to do some playing in New Orleans. Um, after that, I'm going to San Diego for a jazz wire workshop that I'd love to, for you to attend. Then I'm going to the NAM conference, the North American Music Merchants Conference. And I'm going to be working with Eastman saxophones, playing a little bit there, and doing another jazz wire workshop in Pomona, California. So we still have a couple openings for San Diego and Pomona. If that's of interest to you, make your way to the events page. And uh, I hope I get to work with you. Again, that's really what I want to get going in 2020 is start getting connected with you in the real world whenever possible. And for so many of us, that not being possible, Jazzwire is the way for us to do it. Hope to see you there. Take care.